So hey, good morning to all of you over there. The Mutual Fight today, see sweet 2024 someplace. Resort Sunflex is main objective is networking the networks over the last couple of years and over the next two days. Towards what? Towards the mission that we've set for ourselves. Towards the conference patron Amit Shivastav's mission that he's set for himself and for Nutraceutical India. That is mission US dollars, 100 billion. Nutraceutical India. So why not call the man himself, the summit patron and chief, and the founder of Nutrify Today, the virtual lifeline of this summit, and dare I say, after interacting with him over the last 24 months or so, the real pivot and the lifeline of global nutraceuticals, member of Nutra Task Force, Office PSA, the government of India, one and only. Amit Shivasov is the third edition of the C-Suite series and the first in the Sunflex series. India, India is going through a similar scenario. If you look at last one decade of what has happened, India was always a latent market, great potential, but the world waited for India to be there what? they would expect. From there, a decade back to becoming a promising market, to becoming Goichi. a fast running market during lockdowns when it was on the runway. And the interesting news is that India has taken off. So in this takeoff stage, we at Nutrify today, we decided let's do something meaningful for the industry. And let's see if the industry worldwide can leverage this opportunity that is shaping up in India. In this world of artificial intelligence, we cannot follow a format that has existed since, you know, olden centuries and so on. So we created Sunflex and today is the first day of Sunflex. It's not just the term. We experimented last year completely to identify what works for the industry. You'll be amazed to know that we created a buyer sellers uh, point of contacts over 150 and these were agenda driven curated business meetings. And it was conducted on the platform of Sunflex digital platform. Sunflex is enabling democratization of content and hence it's live. What makes a difference at this why did you come here is not the content because content is highly valuable and it's being distributed through digital channels worldwide. It is the networking of the network. Very meaningful, outcome-driven day for you today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. India, 100 billion nutraceutical market. What a, what a wonderful goal for the industry to rally around. In my presentation today, we'll approach that topic from the perspective of U.S. private equity. Uh, all roads leading to India. I think that phrase has real merit from what I've heard here today. So a little bit about Kanos. Um, we focus exclusively on the consumer space, specifically consumable products like food, beverage, ingredients and dietary supplements all within the u.s market our expertise lies with the u.s consumer trends and the various paths to market to reach the consumers in the u.s 
Um, we like to think that there's two key principles to our business. One is find something you know well and stick to it. And the second is never stop developing your network. And the one thing that we feel like we try to know well and try to stick to is the U.S. consumer. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. This is my favorite audience in the world. In nutraceuticals and India. Nutraceuticals today has many emerging champions. We have uh, our Mr. Srivastava, who's doing a great job in his particular focus on bringing excellent software to the process of nutraceutical manufacture and sourcing that leads to standardization, no doubt. He also is an individual who has risen to a very high recognition level with the government of India and he serves on some of their important committees on nutraceuticals. And I think we all, certainly I and Hatsa, look forward to interacting with him and hoping that we can do things together in our own respective areas. We also have Mr. Mariwala, who runs an excellent organization uh, which focuses on herbal products. He also has a very fine company that we all know uh, in this area, in the nutraceutical area. Then we have Hatsa. Uh, Hatsa is a broader organization. It's the first, in, first organization that came into the nutraceutical area. It's about, it's just celebrated last week. It's 10 year anniversary. It works in the area of educating the public, the government, nutritionists in the nutraceutical area. It also runs a lot of training programs, including those for the government and its own, uh, its own programs even during the COVID. Its knowledge base comes from an organization called IATSA, of which it is the only Indian member. IATSA, which is the International Association of Dietary Supplements Association, is the only organization of its type based in Europe that is fiercely promoting and protecting the nutraceutical industry. It has about 50 chapters around the world and Hansa is one of them. The common sharing that we do between our various organizations helps us a great deal in bringing information to the public, to others in the nutraceutical industry, and of course to the government of India, with whom we are active making representations on behalf of our members. We're discussing an important topic, which is to take India to $100 billion nutraceuticals by 2047. And that's an audacious statement in some ways because we stand in pharmaceuticals at about 65 to 70 billion dollars currently, which has a history of so many years behind it. So let me kind of ask Sanjay the first question, which is going to be in this area. Just give me a minute. Yeah. So how important, Sanjay, do you think is the validation, scientific validation for this industry? And especially considering that you have such a deep experience in the global ANI clinical research industry as well. I think the scientific validation of uh, uh, the claims and uh, product and efficacy, I think is the, the, the pivot around which uh, the industry can grow and it becomes extremely important for the industry to pay a lot of attention to, to validating scientifically the products, the way they work, the way they are uh, used in the human body and the way uh, the human uh, uh, responses to um, adopting the, the, the benefits of the uh, nutritional uh, supplements that you deliver uh, to, the, to the human system so that efficacy is assured and, and, is, uh, and, and is delivered uh, ultimately which is what the consumer is paying for. And I think uh, that promise has to be uh, clearly uh, closer. That promise has to be delivered by the manufacturer or the brand that is putting the product out. And I think scientific validation is the most essential element of, of getting this done well uh, to uh, whether you do it through clinical studies and or uh, uh, certain bioavailability studies. I think is a combination of these that uh, the industry deploys and makes them uh, valid uh, substances. I think this is good. Thank you. Well, it so happened that uh, in early 2000, when Novartis exited, it was the need of the hour 
to come forward and have the branded products. So the thing is that many pharmaceutical companies also stopped manufacturing uh, the nutritional supplements, and we were the prime, I mean, suppliers of premixes to almost all the pharmaceutical companies who are manufacturing the uh, nutritional supplements. The thing is that uh, when since we had expertise in the macronutrients, I thought we could have a body of, uh, with the uh, the uh, yeah, protein, carbohydrate, fats, and macronutrients, and launch a product, which we did we successfully well with the Pentasho theme brand being in focus earlier, and this was well accepted by the uh, since we are the one of the first uh, front runners in the industry uh, after these pharmaceutical companies, we were well we were very well accepted by the doctor and dietitian fraternity. At present, the whole world is looking towards India because India is becoming a manufacturing hub and the nutraceutical space, lot of things are happening and this Nutrify today doing a lot on the world label and making a connectivity which was not earlier. Now the worldwide is totally becoming closer as the Nutra is concerned. In Nutra, these days, CMO is most important. Contract manufacturing organization is needed to hold the world because they are having the brand, but they need lot of investment which CMOs do. CMOs are having a lot of automation on the machinery, technology, processes, smart talent, even the R&D, which uh, generate innovation formulations, which is the backbone of this industry, and doing the scientific work on that, which is really needed. At the world level, when we are talking about the global uh, supplies, we do a lot of R&D. And coming up to the global expectations, which was not earlier, making a quality product, which Gion do. At Gion level, we are having a world-class plant to manufacturing the nutraceutical, Ayurvedic ingredients, uh, botanical drugs, and the new doses form, which is the eco-friendly, enjoyable, convenient, which was not the case earlier when we are talking tablets and capsules. Mr. Mali, the, uh, you know, I, I, do, uh, I don't feel young anymore. You know, I've been in the industry for 24 years. Uh, you look it. Uh, but yes, there's tremendous amount of work that we still need to do as an organization and uh, together collectively as well. Um, I think uh, from, uh, from an innovative approach, right? First thing was to put India on the map. We've had Mr. Mariwala do that successfully and a lot of other wonderful companies in India. Uh, the focus was always on the quality build, right? If you can uh, showcase that the products that come out of India have the highest quality, they're clinically efficacious, we have the right dosage in mind, and uh, also focus on uh, simple things like traceability, transparency, you know, the uh, kind of agricultural practices that we have. And more importantly, uh, think what the consumer requires, right? Uh, nutrition has to be different from how a pharmaceutical product is consumed. So different dosage forms. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mr. Ajit Singh and he also brought up this point how the Nutra industry has to keep innovating and keep separating itself from the pharmaceutical industry. And this comes primarily from the kind of dosage forms that we've built uh, and backing those with uh, clin clinical studies globally. Hello delegates. A very good morning to you all. Welcome to the world of AI and our good old friend Nutrify Genie in its new avatar, Nutrify Genie 2.0. Well, let's get into the world of Nutrify Genie 2.0. Friends, last year, you witnessed the free version of gamified Nutrify Genie on mobile phone for ingredient discovery and new product development. My friend Nutrify Genie has evolved now. I am glad to introduce the Nutrify Genie 2.0 now on WhatsApp. 
Nutrify Genie 2.0 is like your business assistant. I will show you some cool stuff. The complicated boring stuff can be demonstrated by my human colleague later on. Let's get into the world of Nutrify Genie 2.0 at WhatsApp. So, WhatsApp, open up and get ready for Nutrify Genie 2.0. Hope internet connectivity is fine as we get into demo. I can go real slow to avoid any internet speed fluctuation. So, let's start. Please, share the information of our curcumin. Okay, that's impressive. What are the clinical trials of ashwagandha for mental health? Sure, quite many may not have been able to read what's written here. Uh, but you will get access to WhatsApp and you can interact. Choose the country, the 11 countries is compliant to 11 countries. You can choose a country and start asking questions. Any questions related to this industry, uh, chemistry, ingredients, regulatory, supply chain, the cost. You want to audit a facility in some remote location in the, in the world, ask. Uh, as this Nurify GD 2.0 and it'll organize everything for you. Uh, now, uh, this is the WhatsApp version and those who are already using Enterprise Solution will be able to access it uh, as a beta version, so we're not opening it all over the world at a time. The purpose of designing Nutrify Genie was how do we, see the speed is the name of the game, in nutraceutical industry. The challenge is, and we had a very interesting session just before this, is responsible nutrition. Look, in speed, you just cannot deviate from the ethics of responsible nutrition because this is going into the body. It is supposed to deliver some health outcome. And consumers, patients, everyone has certain expectations when they ingest a product. The challenge is time. You, know, you may want to do clinical studies. You may want to study all. You may want to explore all studies that exist in the world. And one thing which I often see, even when I go to other countries, is no one seems to be talking too seriously on toxicology in nutraceuticals. Now, this technology will give you a view into whatever you're doing. Is it even going to work together? Is there any heads up on toxicology? So let's take a dive into Neurify Genie and Price Solution. So I'll skip all this marketing part. Look, I just learned a terminology on Google called as Gigo or Gigo, whatever you call it. So garbage in, garbage out. When you talk of artificial intelligence, look, it's just a sophisticated algorithm or software and it is supposed to work on a content. If your content is super curated, accurate, the outcome is going to be good. If it is not, look, you can always design a formula or a recipe on a chat GPT, but would you go ahead with the confidence manufacturing it, assuming that your regulator is gonna approve it? Or are you really sure it's gonna work in your body? You're not gonna trust it because yes, it. There's no validation. Today, Nutrify Genie is able to demand a commanding position purely because what you see here, the platform is sitting on 3.5 million curated data points that includes clinical studies, ingredients, 10,000 ingredients, 11 regulators data, you know, the uh, uh, rule book of biochemistry, and you've got to see how this biochemistry works for you. So this is what this, product does you know it, it'll help you you know uh, reduce your 
ideation time. In my experience, I've been in the business development before with Dr. Ready Labs, and I've seen in other companies, typically it takes about three to six months. This takes now 15 minutes. Uh, so three to six months of six people and 15 minutes of one person. Uh, so compression of time, uh, parallel check, real-time check with the regulatory, and of course, mapping off supply chain based on the gross margin that you're looking at. So we'll experience all that right now. I'll skip this, but then this is a typical process that companies follow. It takes anywhere from one and a half years to two years for an ideation to commercialization of a large responsible company. And using the technology, uh, now you can launch right for an idea or a coffee table to the product at your warehouse in nine, min uh, nine months, sorry. I'll skip this. Anyone who's into artificial intelligence must be getting some media attention, so we do also get, get that. Last year, I demonstrated a gamified version, and I'm very happy to share. Some 168 companies across the world are accessing this app. I'll not spend time too much because you can download an app and play on it. It's a gamified. You don't need to even know science. You just need to know what you want to do. You want to design a product for brain, click on brain, and it'll yeah, it'll immediately uh, take you to what are the possibilities that you can do on Brain. So I'll not spend time on this. Uh, please download and display. You can download it as Nutrify today on your iOS or Android phone. I'll skip this. In the food area in general, and specifically in the nutrition, nutraceuticals, and supplements industry. So um, first of all, a couple of words about us. Um, as it said, we're a venture capital. Um, we're focused in early stage um, investment in food tech startups, which includes nutrition, nutraceutical supplements, and so forth. We have around $250 million assets under management, and we have, and significantly, we're backed by some very large global um, players in the food market including, you can see, for example, Kraft Heinz, Givodan, Puratos, Grupo Wimbo are all partners in our fund. Um, this gives us really good access for our startups into corporate food. Um, and I think that it's a very important part of the, the ambition of growing to a $100 billion industry is how do we move these nutraceutical and supplement solutions maybe out of the realm of pills and tablets and soft gels into food, into functional food and larger global players in the industry of the kind that we're privileged to have as customers. Um, our fund is anchored by Edmund de Rothschild, the Rothschild, Foundation, the Rothschild Fund out of um, Switzerland. How do you think has the consumer changed, especially in a post-COVID scenario? especially from a standpoint of how informed is a consumer today in an Indian context and, and what are your, your views on how do we market to them? So first, thank you very much for having me in this panel discussion. I'm very proud and honored to be here and uh, thanks for everyone for listening. I think it's a very important and interesting subject. Consumer centricity is normally in the world of pharma, nutraceuticals. It's not something we talk a lot about, but I think it's very important because at the end of the day, the consumer is the one who is actually at the end of the day using our product or potentially using our product. Now, what's very interesting sometimes in some companies is that the consumer or the people that we talk to are not only the end users of the product, but they are people who influence the end user, who influence the consumer's purchase decision. And in that case, we would call it more B2B in traditional uh, sense. And that, these are the people who are becoming more informed as well. I give you just one example. Uh, today, uh, people in India, for example, they follow influencers and they follow people who are available or present outside of India. So for example, an influencer sitting in the US has more followers from India than from the US. So people are becoming more informed. Of course, we always use the example that people go search on Google. But I talk about, for example, dermatologists who are some of the people that we work with. Patients go to them and they know they have a list of the things that they want the dermatologist to do. They don't give the dermatologist the time even to say what <laughs> he should recommend. So people are becoming more involved. And I think after the COVID uh, pandemic, people became more cautious and more critical about what they are consuming, whether it's an OTC product, a nutraceutical product, any product, because they are becoming more aware about science, that things need to be scientific, need to be formulated in a specific way, and need to be recommended by doctors 
and of course powered by actives. So people started knowing this more and more. And these are the people who we are talking to, the informed consumer. So the consumers are more informed, the client is more informed, and then we need to adapt our approach accordingly. Nawal, your thoughts, and I'm sure you heard Derma there and you are yeah. really excited and you know raring to go. I think it's an interesting question you ask, who is the informed consumer? And I think in everyday life, we uh, see that. And I'll give you two or three different perspectives, double-clicking on what Rami just said. Uh, the first trend that we see in the business on an informed consumer is a consumer who's searching for ingredients today. Uh, I mean, gone are the days when uh, they just search for the brand name. Today, people want to see the searches on hyaluronic acid, for example or you know ceramides etc they are growing at 200 300 percent on google so which is unprecedented in the past this was never used to happen people used to only search for brands and i uh, you know that's the first trend that we are seeing people are looking at active ingredients because they know what the ingredient can do to them in the skin or in the hair care or in nutritional products and other things so ingredient based search is the first Thing that I see of the uh, informed consumer. The second bit of a change that I'm seeing, uh, uh, which is again a big one thanks to the millennials and the Gen Z consumer, is that the heritage brands are no longer the only defining brands of choice. Okay, uh, thanks to the internet and to Insta, discovery brands are becoming very big. So you don't want to use brands that my parents use unless the brand has remained relevant to me today. When post pandemic, we are seeing a lot of consumer, uh, you know, options, choices, behavior uh, changing in a way that never happened before. Uh, to, uh, to answer your second part of the question first, you know, we are seeing a very, very strong shift post COVID from a curative uh, to preventive, to wellness, and even now to longevity, as Ajit Singh sir had said. So we are seeing a very, very drastic change in people moving towards uh, cosmetics and BMS and uh, you know nutraceutical category. Now, to come back to the first uh, part of the question, I think in terms of the information that the user has today. Um, especially post-COVID and during COVID, they really learned to ask the right questions. They started looking for the right things to look for in a product. Before they were marred by brands, before they were looking at the size of the company, um, the share of the mind that the company is captured by way of marketing. But now they're asking right questions. And I think that's a fundamental shift that has changed and because of those right questions which they are asking themselves they are going onto internet looking at websites looking at portals looking at um, instagram social media going to communities which um, has people suffering or uh, getting affected by similar skin conditions hair conditions needs similar nutraceuticals Hi everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Amit and Nutrify for uh, inviting me to, uh, to speak on, the, on this uh, major event. Well, first of all, uh, where do we start from? Whatever we want to develop something um, from scratch as a concept, uh, where, whether we want to grow what we already have. And we all, somehow we are from school, from sports, we are used to uh, be chasing leadership positions and to be leader, is a bit tough these days. First of all, there are not so many of them. Second, is very difficult to do. So what I always say uh, to my team and to my partners is that, uh, look, uh, it's very good to be right up there. So um, $1 billion. I'm going to be here to teach you a little bit about Google to see if maybe I can help you guys earn that billion dollars. 
I'm gonna talk at a very high level about Google because I know all of you are more CEOs of your companies, but the goal is to give you some action items so that you can go back to your marketing staff and ask some serious questions. So again, as we talked about, I did start No Agency back in 2010. My first client was a supplement client and uh, we just kind of went deeper into there. We do have other clients that are in other fields, but really our niche is in the health and wellness industry. And the reason why this is so important is because Google has different rules for health companies. And this is what we've really been studying. Like, Google actually does tell us what they're looking for, but they do it in a very kind of quiet way because they don't want everyone to crack the code. What they're looking for, it's called your money, your life. So everybody in this room, your website is considered your money, your life. And that means that any website that affects anybody's health, wellness, or financial gets this extra lens from Google. They're looking for what's called EEAT, which is experience, expertise, authoritativeness and trust and your website needs to follow each and every one of these rules so how is this important in the nutraceutical industry as we have been hearing about already today most of our consumers and businesses all over the world look at google first when they're trying to research either an ingredient or some sort of symptom pharmaceutical ingredient nutraceutical to make them feel better. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back um, and to get this opportunity to talk on probiotics and digestive health. And I would like to thank for the introduction and uh, thank the organizers for giving this opportunity today. Yeah, so uh, what I'd like to do is to um, uh, talk a little bit about the opportunities that we see in this area uh, to make a difference with, with probiotics. Um, and uh, first of all, I'd like to just introduce some of these, couple of the areas where we see uh, some great opportunities. And I think uh, the first one uh, that, I'd like, uh, that I'd like to highlight is the, uh, the opportunity that we see in the area of, of functional gastrointestinal disorders. So this is something that um, about 50% of uh, women will suffer from globally uh, and about 36% 30, of uh, males will suffer from. So they will have one or more of these uh, functional disorders. That could be, for instance, uh, constipation, about 12% is the prevalence globally of functional constipation. Um, we have functional, uh, functional diarrhea, we have uh, functional uh, dyspepsia, and we have IBS. Um, IBS that's approximately 5%, 4% are suffering from. It's a little bit depending on the criteria we use to classify, what time of Rome criteria we use to classify. But the prevalence is relatively high, and uh, this is uh, the uh, Okay, so this is the number of publications. So if you measure the interest in number of publications that are being published, we see a significant increase over the years, especially in recent years. And I can tell you that in, uh, according to PubMed, uh, we had some uh, 2,300 2, published papers in 2023 that were dealing with IBS in, in one way or another. So great, a great interest, and many of us are suffering from this condition. It's my pleasure to be here, Amit. Thank you, and thanks to all your team for this opportunity to speak today. So I'm going to talk. I'm the CEO of Industry Transparency Center, and as the middle word would suggest, our ethos is all about transparency, and it's very gratifying to hear that word come up so, so often earlier today. So we are a consumer research data insights and strategy organization. And a lot of the information I'm going to be speaking about today comes from the consumer research program that we've just recently completed. It's our 2024 supplement consumer research. What's interesting about this is that for the first time we actually included India. So we've got the US, UK, Italy, Germany, South Korea, Australia, and India in our panels. 
And uh, so uh, I'm going to go into some of the data. There's going to be a lot of information here. I'm going to try to interpret some of the highlights, but there's a lot more where this came from. All right, so why do consumers take supplements? Okay, um, the first response there is making up for dietary deficiencies. And this is a country breakdown. And you can see that general health and well-being, it over-indexes for the Indian consumers in the population. I want to qualify that this is our first India response. We've got to do some more examination of the data. It's also the first time that I've presented um, this data. So you're actually seeing the first. Okay, health concerns. We've spoken a little bit about general health concerns like mood, gastrointestinal was just talked about, but here are what we're seeing across the globe. And it's amazing to see the similar patterns, but what you need to understand here is that the total size of the bar, the solid and hatched, represents those consumers with a specific health concern. The solid area are those taking supplements currently to address that concern. All of the top four on the left, with the exception of the joint or other pain, have to do with mental health, stress, those types of issues. That's what the bulk of consumers that are supplement users, that's what they need to be in order to qualify for the survey, that's what they're concerned about. You see blood pressure, insomnia, and sleep there. Now the gap area that you want to see, on one side, if they're taking supplements for it, that's great, we understand what our current market is, but those that have the concern that are not taking supplements is what we call a fulfillment gap. How do you see this overall nutrition space growing in India in the next three to five years? So just to uh, give a context, and I'm just quoting data here. Uh, in 2020, the Nutra market was about $4 billion. Currently, it is about $6 billion. So obviously, it has grown quite significantly. Uh, and there's a question is, what are the triggers? What has driven the market? And we'll kind of touch upon that. But of course, the expectation is that it will continue to grow at 12 to 15%. Uh, in the coming years and obviously that becomes an attractive proposition because you don't have many businesses which can grow uh, at this pace uh, and that's why there is this interest uh, but obviously nurturing it correctly is what I believe will drive value uh, and there could be a tendency to also go in the wrong direction right so I think uh, one is about getting to scale but sustaining and building it uh, in a sustainable fashion uh, requires a lot more application, I believe. That's right. Yeah, I think uh, from four to four billion to six billion in a span of three years is phenomenal. I mean, the kind of growth. And I think Amit was talking about it becoming a hundred billion opportunity in India. And I personally see that by 2047, hundred billion, it will happen perhaps faster than that. That's uh, looking at the way last few years have been. So let's, I think, double click on what you just said. In your view, what are some of the uh, triggers and barriers of this growth uh, that you see will help the industry grow faster? So um, let's try to understand the journey from where it was and to where it is now and what can help to probably move further, right? One is there has been an exposure to the, you know, the income level has gone up. There is much more awareness. There is that need to manage your health, take health in your hand. Uh, and, you know, there is uh, this entire kind of a uh, immunity need, which also got triggered during the COVID period, uh, did accelerate, uh, supported by a number of brands coming in. Yeah. And I, this is where I believe that while you can get growth, but making it sustainable is important because while immunity was a big subject in um, during the COVID period, today is practically dead, right? Uh, in some many ways. It's not dead, dead per se, but it's not like the need which was there much more during the COVID period, it has softened. Uh, then, the, you know, kind of this is illness versus wellness. Um, there is a very clear need when there's an illness. And if you look at cradle to grave journey, in early years, you knew, need nutrition. And I'm not saying, you know, supplementation, you need nutrition, you know, uh, you need to eat right food. You need mother's milk and, you know, you need to just be right about what would you consume in the early years and your diet in the early years really clearly determine uh, and there's a lot of data to prove that what your health will be in the, in the future years right so early years having the right nutrition becomes important uh, and you know obviously the, the other end is the healthy aging right uh, then you have chronic diseases 
Uh, but this entire thing about malnutrition, which comes in, which is probably more lifestyle driven, as people grow, people, you know, you know, our jobs, our travel, uh, we don't sleep on time. Uh, you know, we don't eat the right food necessarily all the time. Uh, and that's where, you know, managing your health in a very conscious way becomes absolutely important, I believe. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Nikunj Thakkar. I'm the Global Brand General Manager for uh, our liver care business in Sanofi. I'm based in Germany. Now, uh, as we go in, uh, a quick, quick disclaimer uh, that uh, the ideas and the content which are presented over here are my personal research and uh, do not represent my company's policies or point of view. But the second one was most important over here where I was told you cover Europe in 15 minutes and I said that's a great challenge uh, because it's too expensive and uh, what I tried to do was put together an outline of the key factors which are very important for us to consider. Uh, as we go through the sessions you would see that uh, the topics which are covered could be in itself master classes and while I was a bit anxious about being able to cover them adequately. The good part is that uh, a lot of them have been covered by the previous speakers in bits and pieces. So, so that makes my job much more simpler to refer back to what we have seen already. Now, before we dive into the, the whole nutraceutical part of it, uh, I wanted to take one step back. And, and it's a very interesting conversation that I had last week while I was in Geneva, uh, attending the World Health Assembly where they underlined the power of self-care in achieving health for all. And I think it's a very important lens and a perspective, I would say, that as we assess the global value and the benefits of self-care, it brings in a four win-win-win-win situation. Now, why four is because the individual benefits, the health system benefits, the government benefits, and the industry benefits. Now we're talking about some serious costs over here. So while there is an excitement around assessing what's the size of business, size of industry, I think the costs associated with it are even bigger. And, and I think that's an important lens that we need to bring in out here. So while we look at the why, uh, what I wanted to draw your attention was that in the entire self-care continuum, uh, there are several factors out here uh, but when we look at self-care, we're talking about self-management, we're talking about self-testing, self-awareness, but also management with the spectrum of solutions which are existing and nutraceutical being one very important pillar of this. And, and I think this is what I wanted us to appreciate before we move on to the topic or zoom into the Europe as a geography. If I was given one slide to capture the data behind it because the data could be I'd like to thank my good friend Amit <clears throat> and uh, the team from Nutrify today for inviting me uh, I understand that I'm an odd person out here I'm not an industrialist I'm not in the nutraceutical industry as such I'm a doctor diabetologist but I'm also a researcher so what made me write this book and if you have not read it, uh, I'd be happy if you could get a copy and read it. So the book is entitled Making Excellence a Habit. And uh, this was prompted by many of my friends from abroad who said, how can a clinician also do research and also do charity and also run institutions? How do you all, how do you do this all together? So I thought about it and that's how this book came, Making Excellence a Habit. So the book is not meant for obviously people are much more successful than me and I've been listening from the morning to several people who have made uh, excellent uh, speeches and given so many of their ideas but it's mainly meant for youngsters. How do you achieve excellence in whatever you do? So three or four stories from my life itself is that the first thing is never give up if you feel that your, your life has taken a, a downturn. When I was in pre-university, uh, this is the year where it's like our NEET exam that you write or the JEE and go to uh, me or your career gets decided. The pre-university is only total of eight months. <clears throat> and that eight months actually decides your whole career, whether you get into medicine or engineering or whatever. 
Now during those eight months, I fell ill three times and I lost almost two months and I thought I'm not even going to write the exam. So I had almost given up when one of my teachers said, it's not too late, can you make a sacrifice and can you give up your lunch for the next one month and I'll bring you up to the top of the class. And I did that for the next one month, I sacrificed my lunch. And not only did I make up the lessons that I had lost, but finally when the university exam marks came, I stood first in the university and I got into three medical colleges, not into one. So as the American saying goes, it ain't over until it's over. So never give up when you think that things are down, there can be a sudden change and all you need is that one good uh, person to help you and then like many of you have come here seeking for funding and I'm sure today is going to be a turning point in your life. And ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jeevishwanan and I'm also known as Vishi. Uh, I'm here to present the most exciting and the awaiting Sea Suit Summifex 2024 Innovation Battlefield. So this Innovation Battlefield is a Sangam of innovators, entrepreneurs, judges, investors, and more importantly, the responsible nutrition ecosystem. It's very important that we need to share what exactly went behind when this particular battlefield was decided. It was close to some three, four months back wherein the Nutrify team, they thought of coming with this innovation battlefield. The judges meticulously, they screened over 130 application from seven countries. Let me again quote it, 130 applications from seven countries. And all you 10 people who are there, you should be prop fully proud about you being here, okay? And Thank you very much for all the judges from Kiran to Ramji to Dr. Vikram, Dr. Brijesh, Professor Raja, Nikita, Dhawal, uh, that's my name, Vishi, uh, Dr. Babu, Professor Yadav, and Bal Kumarji. And they, they spent a lot of time screening close to 50 odd applicants. Uh, then we went about fine tuning and getting this top 10 innovators. BioLooper is a technological company and basically we validate that any of your product, let's say, works for the specific individual, for the specific topic, at a specific time, in combination. The BioLoop is an intervention that has up to three different parts, nutrition, physical training, mental health. Hey, Marco. Um, I was wondering what actually is the data that you're collecting to your list? So Marco, uh, do you think your model is applicable in a scenario in India where large population is rural and, and don't have too much access to technology? Uh, so we have, so um, Shiva, my, my partner, uh, is, is, you know, actually I have it. I'm just looking to find them somewhere very far but uh, so uh, we work already in India with Rajasthan Royals we work with some uh, professional golfer uh, and there is actually in uh, have a lot of slides yeah so Shiva has actually a clinic in in, in Bangalore and that's, so our first step is taking these 800 clients and putting on the platform and the two things are happening in doing so Dr. Banerjee congratulations Thank you. Um, very interested in uh, what has been built by your company. Uh, it's captivating, it's mind-boggling that uh, skin microbiome is playing such an important uh, role in, uh, uh, you know, in dermatology and I have made a few investments in skin companies, skin healthcare companies, so I uh, want to learn a little bit more on the, on the business model and the GTM. So, uh, our business model is basically building the uh, community one part but in a multiple channel. So one channel is of course off online channel where you want to increase the awareness from a consumer point of view because a lot of people know gut microbiome. So but skin microbiome in India at least still in the early stage or nascent stage. So giving the importance, giving the importance in terms of awareness, how skin, important, skin microbiome is more important for better skin health. And if you better skin health or healthy skin is always a beautiful skin. So that type of awareness uh, from a topical application. A lot of people are working on gut microbiome, gut skin axis, 
you consume have it so that can be a separate part discussion we can collaborate with somebody but as of now we are focusing only on the skin microbiome from a topical point of view hi congratulations hi. thank you can you tell me in 60 seconds or less why i should invest in you uh why you 60 seconds or less why i should invest in you ah okay okay um uh, I, uh, I believe uh, from my research and findings that uh, the aroma compounds can improve our health enormously, which the medication cannot do that. So I want to make, uh, from my discovery, make products that can help people. Uh, so this is the, the technique that never had been applied to uh, nutraceuticals and to uh, Cosmetics uh, was uh, so ever so that will make the people happier. Yeah. Thank you, but I, I'm an investor, mm -hmm. and as an investor, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I need to get a lot more money back than what I invested. How am I going to do it? Yes, how how I can make your money back? Okay, uh, now there is uh, the bio industry is only focus on biosciences. And uh, my Dharma Cosmetics uh, also started from bio-industry, bio-science. But I think I can put this and confuse with, uh, uh, in mix with uh, IT technology. So in our company, I have a software engineer. And I believe this AI technology and large language models, so I can uh, input, I, I can train that model with uh, my insights based on my technology and my research and then uh, can uh, make a, a new uh, tools uh, for the uh, cosmetics uh, that marketing the cosmetic industry uh, significantly with this new AI technology based uh, marketing tools. So how would you set your priority in terms of uh, um, uh, focusing on the market and uh, the product combo? What, uh, you have many choices and you have many ways to go. What is going to be your direction set here? Uh, sir, uh, we've started off with astaxanthin and astaxanthin I think can be a molecule to kind of just get us our foot into the carotenoid space. But definitely we would like to work with industry and to be able to uh, work on molecules where uh, we can really solve a problem for the industry and then take it from there. And with the right partnerships, I'm very confident that uh, not only uh, astaxanthin, we can select the right molecules and be able to uh, kind of uh, uh, enter the, in the market. I, I have lots more questions yes. uh, and some of them are going to be difficult ones. Yes, please. Um, what I understand is you've built a platform yes. for fermenting uh, carotenoids. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, what you, I presume you're doing is building pure carotenoids using this platform, like a pure astaxanthin, 98%, 99%. Is that correct? Is that understanding correct? Yes. So, I mean, it's a journey, but uh, definitely, so what we are really doing, in fact, uh, the cosmetic product really proves my point here, right? So even before we hit that 99%, we have a product, right? So generally, a traditional uh, biotech or a precision fermentation company uh, would launch their product only when they hit that. But what we have realized as a sweet spot for us is that even before we hit that, there is a product that we can already launch in the market with the right demand, and that is the cosmetic grade product. So we're starting off with that. And then yes, uh, we are, uh, whatever we've started doing in the lab, we should be hitting uh, the pure grades uh, in about a year's time to be able to take that to the different uh, applications. For me, the biggest concern with uh, mushroom extracts is uh, uh, qualification and quantification of the metabolites, right? right. So you mentioned about uh, cordycepin content and cordyceps. What about lion's mane and uh, reishi, which are the other two mushrooms that you cultivate and you extract too? Right. So, so typically, uh, what we've seen from buyer demand is uh, for lion's mane and reishi, they're looking for two bioactives, uh, beta-glucans and polysaturates, essentially. Uh, in uh, the other bioactives, for example, in uh, lion's mane is herinitian. Uh, there are standards available which are frightfully expensive, not yet in India. There are hardly any NABL labs which have the no withhold of also how to take, uh, get the testing done. We are facing that currently problem. However, there is no demand from any consumer that we've seen right now asking for these specifications yet. 
So as was introduced, I am the head of global regulatory strategy for Reckitt's vitamin mineral supplement business based in New Jersey. I've worked in supplements my entire career. Um, and as was mentioned yesterday from Mr. Ajit, uh, I also represent IADSA, the International Alliance of Dietary Supplement Associations. I'm the treasurer of that group, and we are a global trade association working with Hadza and other industries here in India um, to try to educate and influence and grow this responsible nutrition, this dietary supplement industry that we're all here to represent. So what do we mean when we say complexity? We mean that not regu regulations are not harmonized. You guys heard that yesterday. There likely will never be harmonization. But what does that translate to? That means that in markets around the world, you have different governments. Sometimes it's the food authority, sometimes it's the drug authority, sometimes it's a combined authority overseeing this category. And it can run the spectrum. You have different pre-market approval processes varying on the region and the market, different safety standards, different claims territory, different ingredient allowances, different importation requirements. All of that varies even within the same region. Even if you go to EU, it is harmonized, but each individual market in Europe still has its own different criteria when it comes to food supplements. And all of those details add to the complexity for anybody here looking to grow their business internationally. So just want to give a brief background about myself just to tell you why I'm here. So I've started off life in brand management in P&G, Kellogg's and Friesland. I've worked in the Middle East. I was uh, head of consumer healthcare marketing for GSK Consumer, which is now Helion. I've uh, moved to the UK. I was global innovation director at GSK uh, in the UK, handling multiple categories. And I did entry strategies for India, China, Brazil, for the oral care business. Then I moved on and when GSK acquired a dermatology company, I was um, heading up the commercial operations for Asia for dermatology, which included cosmetic dermatology as well as uh, pharmaceutical dermatology. And then I was, uh, I joined Mundi Pharma as global head of consumer. So I joined as employee number one to set up their consumer healthcare business and expanded that from a couple of markets in APAC to expand it to global, so launched across Europe, across Latin America, across uh, North America as well. And then I've done quite a bit of work with Abbott in terms of helping develop their consumer health strategy for the pharma business and for the COVID portfolio as well. So I worked with uh, Abbott Devices business as a consultant and also with the uh, Abbott uh, Pharma business as a consultant to develop the consumer health portfolio. And uh, now pretty much I've uh, joined Align Technology, which is an orthodontic, digital orthodontics firm. We've got a brand called Invisalign, and I head up marketing, clinical, and commercial operations uh, for Asia Pacific based out of Singapore. And uh, I also sit on the board of the World Federation of Advertisers. So I'm on the global executive board, and I was the vice president for Asia there as well. So we've got a bit of background in VMS, uh, in consumer health across Asia Pacific, done a bit of entry strategy work across pretty much every market in the world. So just to take on in terms of what are the markets we look at within APAC. Now, this is data I have from Nicholas Hall. So I've got permission from them to reproduce the data here. We know Nicholas Hall is one of the top firms that covers consumer healthcare. And the data I'm showing you here is data that is excluding India, and this pretty much covers the VMS category. So there'll be some categories that won't be covered. And if you look at IQVI, you look at Nicholas Hall, there will be differences in terms of data. So take this as guidelines rather than taking this in absolute terms. What I've done is I've uh, changed the data to show you what the 2023 market size is for each of these countries, what the projected market size is gonna be in 2033. And that gives you what is the forecasted growth coming in, in millions of dollars in each of these markets and the CAGR coming in there. So no surprises there. If you look at China, China is the number one market. Unfortunately, this covers, uh, this covers the entire thing. So the first on the top is China, if people who can't see that, uh, that is expected to grow about $9.2 billion uh, over the next 10 years. So uh, largest market there. The second one is Indonesia. That's going to grow about $770 million over the next 10 years. So it's a very significant potential in the market. Followed by the third one is Australia New Zealand. Now Australia New Zealand is already a mature market. 
it's pretty much if you look at it currently it's the third largest market anyway it's about a 1.2 billion dollar market but uh, australia is going to grow about half a billion dollars as well so very significant growth coming in and then if you go down the chain you got south korea which we know is a large market that's going to grow at about 375 million hello everyone i'm shinsaku takaoka uh, vice chairman of japan nato kindness association and uh, director of Japan Bioscience Laboratory. Today, I want to introduce Nato Kainese. Here are today's topics, and I want to talk about these topics, and I would all to know about Nato Kainese in 15 presentation. Please let me explain what Nato Kainese is. Nato Kainese is serine protease found in Nato. Natto kinase is uh, dissolves the fibrin. In other words, it dissolves blood clots without inhibiting own healing. The activity is indicated with FU, uh, which means phenolytic units. Next, I want to uh, explain what thrombosis is. Uh, thrombosis is a scab made with hemocyte and platelet tangled with fibrin to prepare injured vessel. When a blood vessel is injured and bleeds, a thrombus is formed to heal the wound. Once the blood vessel is repaired, the thrombus is broken down by plasmin, a thrombotic enzyme in the body. However, the thrombus can't be removed if fibrinic activity is, is degraded to various reasons, such as aging, stress, and so on. Here is our raw material, NSKSD, NATO kinase. NSKSD has more than 20,000 FU NATO kinase activity per gram. Also, NSKSD contains no vitamin K2 and has no smell of NATO. Recommended daily doses intake is 2,000 uh, FU per day, and it's equivalent to 100 mg of NSKSD raw material. Finally, we have received a message from Dr. We are close to. Dr. Junichi Niyomiya is a cardiovascular internal medicine specialist and general internal now medicine specialist and cardiovascular surgeon, surgery specialist at Shinagawa East Clinic. Speaking of a relationship with JBS and Dr. Junichi Ninomiya submitted a paper and about clinical study to effect and safety of natural kindness administration. Cardiovascular partner with Warfarin. JBS natural kindness was used in the study, and it was found the combination of warfarin and natto kinase caused, caused no side effect. So today I'm going to speak uh, about the uh, evolving uh, uh, R&D and, uh, and the landscape in which we are uh, operating. And definitely there is a lot of changes, right, uh, going on. So. Uh, somewhat, uh, the way to access the business has, uh, has been made uh, much, much more easier nowadays than it has been in the past. You know, the fact that we can commercialize through e-commerce, the fact that there is plenty of uh, CDMO, CRO here to develop your product, the fact that we can access to uh, a lot of formulations and claims from uh, the EI is making the way to enter into the, the business and the category much more uh, easy now. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, um, the consumers are also becoming much more demanding, which is also creating some uh, some its own challenges. And as we have been hearing for the past two days, the regulatory landscape is also becoming much more uh, difficult to navigate uh, nowadays. The food supplement industry has been under-regulated for a lot of years, but now the regulation is strengthening, and it's something that we shall not underestimate as we are moving into the uh, the category. From the player's point of view, um, if the cake, shall I say, is becoming bigger and bigger, and again, we have been speaking about the size of that business, which is going to uh, 
come to 100 uh, billions uh, anytime soon. This is also attracting a lot of new players. So shall it be the small startup? But it's also the traditional players who are right now uh, trying to get the bigger slice of that, uh, of that cake. And this is creating a lot of competition. When we're talking about health and trends, right? How far do you feel that, because everything is about, you know, we've been talking in the last two days, understanding the customer needs, right? What route, what role do health and health, you know, analysis of health and trends play a role in building the sustainable brands? And how, how can companies, my sub part of this is, how can companies stay and anticipate these trends better? Because typically what happens, I mean, you, you've seen it, as you very rightly said, this market does not exist. Why should I go into that market? And then when suddenly some, somebody tells you, oh, no, the competition is going, let me also, and then become the red ocean. So how, how does one stay ahead? How, do one, how does one analyze the trends and stay ahead of these trends? That would be my question. Okay, good question. In fact, two questions. So yeah, I'll start with questions. the first one. I think in my experience, the good part about being a marketeer is because the consumer is always evolving, unless you listen, you will be obsolete. And references of consumers are changing every single day. They are changing. They in are fact, changing. there was some study that came out last year by Accenture, in, which was talking about 63% of the people are actually looking for brands and switching to brands that are now part of their belief systems. Mm -hmm. It might be sustainability, organic, wellness, whatever that might be. It, this, this has the lexicon is coming into pharma strategy also. Patient insights, customer insight, patient journey mapping, you know, which were not there five years ago. One would rarely see it, but today companies are investing into that, not just doing that. So thanks, thanks, Bukhar. We'll see whether we can come up with a follow-up question to all of you. Now, everything is fine that you have a product. You have a product and there is a customer demand. We talked about mergers and acquisitions. We talked about how companies can stay ahead of the trend. But all that fails if the supply of the product is not there. Right? So my question to Sriram, you know this. I mean, you come from a uh, you know uh, strategy background and where you put this. What are, we talk about suppliers. What are some of the, and supply chain becomes very important. What are some of the strategies which can build up a sustainable, customer supplier linkage i would want your new this because you very successfully done this so on the first uh, you know when you want to build a very sustainable supply chain uh, and a commercial process it's like you know doing a marriage doing, you know, very, doing a marriage successful marriage, marriage yeah. uh, if you are not going to do your background checks well at the end of the day, you know, you're going to rue that you Horoscope. <laughs> <laughs> Not only the horoscope, what we're... Uh, yeah, in a way, horoscope, because yes, we today have, you know, uh, agencies which are actually right. accrediting all the suppliers right. from every uh, data point, whether it is from uh, their financial standpoint, it is from, uh, you know, the whole process that they follow, okay? Mm -hmm. Whether they themselves have a very... Uh, sustainable pathway in terms of ensuring from you know farm to market whether that process is very robust or not what are the news uh, you know uh, that is buzzing around which impacts the supply chain so I think that in the very beginning you should do a lot of homework because when you do that homework you can ensure that what you are delivering to the consumer is always consistent I would put it means uh, if you look at say any of say the brand success, there is you know like a typical brand success you know like launch model. So if you look at say Procter & Gamble where I retired from you know like a couple of years back, the model speaks of product superiority as say the first key metric and all that we have ended up discussing has got to do with product superiority now. Every company talks of you know like product superiority like there is no other, you know, like, like their product, but a product superiority in the eyes of consumer. The consumer centricity whereon a consumer perceives your product to be superior to all the competing brands in the category which are, you know, like sitting in. That's the first and the foremost. The second, I won't uh, delve into the rest, otherwise it's the packaging, it's your brand communications, it's your retail execution and it's your customer and consumer value equation. Out of these five metrics, if you have lost out on three, 
your brand would be a failure in the market you do whatever good that you want to do with the first two my name is brian i'm from malaysia uh, first i want to thank uh, nutrify and also the malaysian palm oil council for inviting me to share um, an extract a compound derived from malaysian oil palm so uh, there are a lot of uh, palm phytonutrients from the flash from the crude palm oil extracted from the fruits there are two parts of um, oil that you can get from the oil palm fruits the flash on the kernel the kernel they have a similar profile like the coconut oil the oil from the flash we get we, we call it the crude palm oil 99% is fat 1% is the uh, micronutrient the uh, phytonutrients yeah which is tocotrienol tocopherols squalene carotenoids uh, phytosterols coenzyme Q10 and polyphenols and phospholipids so today I'm going to share with you the vitamin E you know and also the white tocotrienol from oil palm so from this slide you can see the molecular structures of two form of vitamin E the tocopherols and the tocotrienol if you look at their molecular structure they are very similar they have a chromano ring and a tail a chromano ring and a tail the difference between tocopherol and tocotrienol is at the tail tocotrienol they have three unsaturated bonds that's how they get their name tocotrienols okay in the loose term uh, we call tocopherol the saturated form of vitamin E tocotrienol the unsaturated form of vitamin E okay just like fats under the fats family we have the saturated fats polyunsaturated fats right and we know these two fats they have overlapping biological activity say for example irrespective you take the fats from animals from plant when it goes into our body our body will convert it into calorie right so those are the overlapping biological activity similar to uh, vitamin e they are uh, uh, a nutrients that our body cannot synthesize so we have to get it from diet that's why they call it vitamins and deficiency of vitamin e can cause fertility problems and that's how they got the name to call um, uh, tocopherols okay good afternoon nutra enthusiast at the outset i'd like to thank amit and nutrify for having us here i'm actually filling in for uh, my managing director mr bharat javar who was supposed to make this talk but had to go on an urgent overseas trip so i'm going to talk on the emerging probiotic landscape in india the journey from it being an adjuvant to therapeutic so I'm glad to share that there has been a welcome shift, a welcome shift in the management of diarrhea. 25 years ago, antibiotics were mainly used to treat diarrhea, but there has been a welcome shift. Today, it is indeed gratifying to note that probiotics are being used as the treatment choice when it comes especially to pediatric diarrhea. So this transformation was largely enabled by the evolution in usage by the medical fraternity Earlier, 25 years ago, when I started my career with Tablets in Limited, doctors were mainly using probiotics as an adjuvant in gut disturbances. But today you'll be surprised to know there are doctors, there are nephrologists who are using probiotics to reduce uremic toxin load even in chronic kidney disease patients. So that transformation has been done by the medical fraternity. Better clinical outcomes as seen by the medical fraternity has driven the expansion in user of probiotics. Companies like Tablets India Limited and other stakeholder companies have kept the flag of probiotics flying high and also played a major role in pivoting the usage of probiotics from just being an adjuvant to making it a therapeutic choice as well today. This is what the Philippines is. It's a land of beauty, it's a land of the sea, the shores, sand, sun, sunshine for four months and rain for the other eight months. Uh, it's a country that is very vibrant, very robust. And as other speakers spoke about it, it is probably in the top, top five of the Asian market. 
uh, for nutraceuticals. On the flip side, this is what the other side of Philippines is. The, the photograph in the corner is a typhoon. We have 26 or 30 of these every year. These are hurricanes of tremendous power, wind and rain. But it makes the country a wonderful place for the nutraceutical markets. Just to give you an analysis and overview in my next slide, this is what the scenario of the Philippines market is. It's part of, Philippines is part of the Southeast Asian group of countries known as the ASEAN and it's located at the extreme end bordering on the, both the Pacific Ocean and the West Philippine Sea. It's an archipelago and consists of over 7,000 islands. So transport between the islands is mainly by sea, land and air. Uh, it's very challenging traveling around but it is now becoming much more convenient with the uh, air services. Population is around 115 million people and it's an English speaking country. So doing business in the Philippines is very easy. Okay, this is what the current market looks like. It's estimated at US dollars 570 to 575 million. In comparison, the current pharmaceutical market is over US dollars 8 billion. So it gives you an idea of what the scope of having the nutraceutical market to improve. The VMS market is expected to reach US dollars 800 million. There's a typo error there in 2030 and this is considering an annual growth rate of 9.32 percent for the philippines market share of the vms market if you look at it is the otc products 43 percent this is including the adult and pedia uh, nutraceuticals vitamins and supplements at 34 percent herbal and traditional medicines at 12 percent there is immense potential for India here. The growth factors that we are talking about are just the beginning of some kind of an explosion that can happen because what we are talking about of 575-75 is mainly taken over by mostly the multinationals and in, in, in this area where India is growing and it's being looked at by the world as a potential for this, for not just manufacturing, but for making quality products. I believe the Philippines is quite ready for that kind of a growth. What do you see the recent developments of nutraceuticals being considered? Well, I'll change my concept. I would want the individuals to talk about their experience, their knowledge for the nutraceutical market. Start with Dr. Haldeh. Thank you, Dr. Arun, and I think uh, you are a fantastic uh, host and also the moderator. Thank you for and would like to thanks to the organizer of uh, this is something coming to the Taj. When you ask your driver that I want to go to Taj today, he looks at oh Taj. So this is like a Maha Taj, and we should clap for the entire organizing team and thank you. I know that. People are spending time on networking, but this is also a good discussion if they can attend. I would say that the nutraceutical industry has taken a shape in India when the Food Safety and Standard Authority has implemented the rules in 5th of August 2011. Till that time, we were not very clear where we belong to. So, few of the products under Pharma, few of the products under uh, Ayush, few of the products under PFA, then it was a PFA, Prevention of Adulteration Act. After 2011, now close to 14 years, we got a home, which is the FSSAA. And there is a difference between nutraceutical and pharmaceutical. I know that a lot of pharmaceutical people are interested here, but let me tell you, you can take the, and my colleague uh, Nazanin is here, Omega-3 tablet without even consultation, you can take it, but you don't take crocin. You don't take crocin tablet, let's take a crocin today. We can't do that. So, nutraceutical is nutraceutical. It is concentrate of the food for the actives and it has various types. Now, there is a regulation and because that regulation is govern, governing the our industry, 
let's adhere to the regulation rather than pushing it towards the pharma so that is my opening statement i will cover regulatory wise but let me tell you nutraceutical industry is like a cream in the milk if you remove that there is no value to the food processing industry it is the cream and if you just take it out to the other sector then what is the use of that these are my opening statement absolutely right nazneen what do you think the reason why i'm asking you are the influencers towards our consumers so what's your perception of the nutraceutical industry and the consumer awareness for that uh thank you so much for that uh, question uh, uh, i think the our, our panel theme is evolving and i think that's a very relevant one because if you see the consumers initially there was a lot of confusion regarding nutraceuticals then there was a stage where there is awareness now there is acceptance but we don't know whether there will be adherence okay so Sorry. i think that that pathway of evolving and i think it will always be evolving because at some point of time we'll have to kind of look at different things and as a dietitian who's kind of talking to the consumer there's a lot of confusion because one that there is a lot of knowledge but whether that is correct whether that is adequate um whether it translates into behavior of purchasing and adhering to it it's still not very clear so that's my take probably yeah. with with you as a dietitian Consumer. is facing and yeah. very accepted very accepted mega what do you think you've got experience both in pharmaceuticals and nutraceutical ingredients for so what's your perspective with regard to nutraceutical industry yeah thank you so much uh, arun ji for that question i think there has been a fantastic start to this panel and there is a lot uh, that will be spoken about uh, in the few more minutes to come but uh, as far as my per- perspective is concerned honestly uh, my perspective has changed because i come from a pharma background but my perspective has changed uh, to to the fact being that i mean uh, there is a lot of value that nutraceuticals hold in terms of being able to fulfill the demand that your diet cannot what your food essentially alone cannot uh nutraceuticals will help fulfill and that would basically lead to improved or healthy uh lifestyle so also you would be able to age in a healthy manner so i mean this is just a just a just a beginning just the beginning of the discussion so from that standpoint i feel uh as we all want to move towards a healthy aging uh uh era i would say from that st- from that perspective i think we're pretty much uh there i mean we are evolving and that's all i mean that's the discussion that's going to be about well said mega good good for us that shri guru sir you've come from japan and introduced your nutrition supplement which is soya based in india what brings you in india in terms of the market the nutraceutical market that we have because you have already built up a brand which is about 200 million dollars yes. all over the globe so what's your expectations from india i don't have any background of nutraceutical industry <laughs> just only uh, my opinion is uh, like a uh, customer's point of view <laughs> and uh, as, uh, to be honest uh, it is the first time to participate a nutra nutraceutical exhibition for my first time so <laughs> please be comfortable okay okay, okay. no 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 it's okay and uh, i i can feel some gap between japan and india uh, we japanese uh, com- the japanese a company uh, regulated at least one year health check measurement understand mm. but uh, so we can understand easily my self care uh in from the one year medical check i want to just build on uh, what they said is uh, i think uh, nutraceutical as a tool to bridge the deficiency which a diet cannot fulfill i think that fact has been established and i think it is getting more and more stronger what i am working on currently is what is the role of nutrition as medical nutrition therapy where 
you can use the nutraceuticals to bring a health outcome now that health outcome can come alone or it can complement the medicines which are already there so that is the area where i am currently working on and i think that is the direction in which we are evolving as well so i think i will i'll stop there yeah thank like any pharma guy who is joining nutraceutical industry he would think in a pharma way and in pharmaceutical way of looking at it there is always a question mark that are nutraceutical products working enough so there is a way that the way i would look at it is is a pharma way in which i should look at nutraceutical or should is a nutraceutical way in which i should look at nutraceutical so when i was joining in the first couple of months what was going in my mind was understanding nutra space and i was thinking in my mind that what is nutra so i was checking with people and somebody told me that nutra is like preventive and pharma is in the treatment and i was thinking in my mind that it cannot be for anything to be working i should be thinking about working in the treatment area the second thing which was told to me that rda limits define what is nutra and what is non nutra again i was thinking that anything which is sub therapeutic i will not be able to go either to the patient or the doctors i should be able to be convinced that what i am doing is giving the right outcomes then i was thinking that is op- approving authorities define that what is pharma or nutra again i was thinking that this is not the way i should not get in my mind entangled with what is op- approving author- authorities way of looking at it and neither i was looking that whether it is channel of promotion whether it is to doctor or consumer should come in a way i should think about two things where is my focus is my focus is on the disease and or condition what disease areas i should be focusing on and the second thing is am i going to focus in my uh, marketing model on a consumer or a doctor so these were the early stages and then when i was un- trying to understand from where nutraceutical came in i was told that dr stephen defillis is the one who coined for the first time the word nutraceutical and then i was trying to understand what is that dr stephen defillis had to tell about nutraceuticals and then i realized that what it mentioned over there is any food or food parts that provide medical or health benefit including preventions and or treatment so this clarified in my mind that i am not focusing on nutraceutical only for prevention i can look at prevention or the treatment and i am looking at health outcomes would like to know what is the present government focus uh when it comes to the nutraceutical sector uh, thank you dr vivekul uh when we talk about government perspective we basically look first from a socio economic uh, perspective that the socio economic group in india whether really have a equity in nutrition access or not and when we when we are talking and discussing about integrating science and policy it's very crucial because we have a very diverse and complex nutritional requirement so from government perspective it's what we are focusing as how we can leverage data identify deficiency target the uh, the population which really need those kind of requirement because based on the demographic group what we are having okay uh, so uh, i'll move on to miss aparna aparna what is your view on the present state of innovation because i know from your uh, from your introduction you are an innovation lady okay in the company so i would really want to know what is the what do you feel is the present state of innovation in this sector so yeah uh, uh, very true the innovations are now being accepted uh, people are looking out for new innovative uh, formats new compounds i mean if we see uh, in the past uh, it was only uh, nutrition is perceived as the milk modifiers people using milk modifiers and they feel that yes we are getting the complete nutrition but over the years the uh, the awareness you can say the, because of the awareness now the uh, consumer is more knowledgeable they have more access to the information they do search they search for what they are eating what they are consuming and 
from the milk modifiers we have seen the change coming in the consumer uh, acceptability for the different kind of nutrition supplement formats usura uh, so you are a regulatory expert here right for us okay good uh, so what do you feel and what is your present view basically regarding the present issue pertaining to product claims made on the nutraceutical products the nutra industry is evolving now uh, if you compare like uh, you know in the past 10 years or maybe even earlier and the current scenario it has evolved drastically and so are the claims being evolved and because of this evolving nutraceutical segment there are innovative claims as well being developed wherein uh, the consumers are now more knowledgeable and uh, you know they know and understand the product portfolios and uh, they look at the claims before they buy the products so it has uh, become a usual practice for the industry to bring out some catchy claims to target up their uh, consumer base now with these set of claims uh, there are efficacy claims there are manufacturing related claims there are disease risk reduction claims and many more uh, alike so dr tipati one small question what has kept then after this hearing what usra said what has kept the nutra industry shackled okay thank you dr vaibhav Uh, uh for this question we don't uh, find any reason you know like the cycling of the nutraceutical sector but there are definitely number of challenges those challenges are basically uh, start from the you know like uh, awareness and uh, if we see you know geographically the uh, industry those are nearby the nematodes and industries people are getting more aware faster and awareness itself is a very big challenge sometimes if we see you know like the, they are deputing us from my getting the consultant and the consultant is itself is not aware about the what should do the nutraceutical but in bound if we see certain dollar areas far areas if they are getting the establishment and one thing is this other point is standardization of quality and the establishment of the parameter thanks uh, dr tripathi so mr vijendra how can you nutra industry effectively raise customer awareness about the importance of nutraceuticals for overall health and well being uh, very good question thank you uh, if you really want to achieve because today the reason why we are gathered here where we are having a vision of achieving 100 billion dollar right so only it is possible when our customers really aware about the importance of nutrition when that consumption really kicks in then it is possible to achieve this vision when our facilitator was talking right now that you know 4 billion dollar uh, you know is the 4000 billion dollar is the sorry 4 billion dollar is the current uh, you know uh, achievement what we have achieved already market as a market if you really achieve by 2028 uh, 14 billion dollar is because of the kind of awareness you know people should carry if i simply take an example as we know we have eradicated so much of infectious diseases right but what is really causing the challenges is the non communicable diseases right that non communicable diseases is because of the kind of nutrition even rahul did mention that how many even though we are 7 billion dollar so 7 billion populations across the world and 140 crore people in india how many of us are real nutrition deficient when i serve my food am i really thinking how much of dense calorie i'm consuming in place of nutrient dense food i'm taking so wins mission and vision is to increase gender diversity at the sweet sweet and why do you say this is important is because when you have a diversified workforce especially in your leadership position of course in all other fields as well you automatically see an improvement in your numbers in um whether it's your pnl or your balance sheet and i think that's been proven across multiple studies when we do that as an organization not only does our organization benefit but also our industry benefits and i've heard multiple times today that as 
our country and as an industry within India, we are striving for really big numbers in a few years. So when we talked about what are different ways of acceleration, I think this is definitely one of them. WIN started only two years ago in 2022. It's been started by some extremely passionate founding members and sponsors. And within the first year, we were able to form our board of directors. Within the second year, we actually have 25 sponsors. We have 25 partners across the, um, organize, across the industry. 441 members, and I'm sure these numbers are a little bit out of date because the numbers must be much higher today. And we've also done a publication of our gender diversity report, which is available on our website. And fast forward now to this year, in 2024, we have nine, 91 volunteers, by the way, out of which six, seven come from India alone. Seven committees, 4,000 plus LinkedIn followers. So as a member or as a sponsor, when you join WIN, not only you get, do you get an instant gratification of being able to commit and contribute to an amazing cause, but also get the benefit of this exposure. Gorgeous. gorgeous and uh, very net strong networking okay. than I expected in Japan yes okay. very uh, okay. good opportunity the chance that we can sh uh, we can uh, we can share the information about NATO kindness this event was really helpful because um we were um, eager to um, penetrate the Indian markets and the, the, the countries around um, this India country a very good platform it gives opportunity to multiple people from multiple dimension and explore the products exactly. and also see what is best suitable for their needs correct, so correct. this is a very unique kind of sunflex are you liking it i'm liking it so i was uh, in the uh, uh, the beauty industry okay. where i when i came here i feel like i i was it in my complex so at first he was really worried of going here, but he always thinks that countries you're going to, you can learn a lot from that. Okay. And compared to what he was thinking, he learned way more from India than he was expecting. Really? So he really likes it here. We are from Korea okay. and new uh, brand with okay. new product of okay. hemp seed ingredients. Okay. And when it's some good connection with uh, partners, especially the distribution channels and also financial strategies. So, uh, he gives me some hint okay. how can I uh, you know, expand our brand in uh, Indian territory. First of all, thank you very much for your time today. It was really amazing and interactive, very outcome driven. I saw that the business lounge was throughout busy and I guess it is still busy. Uh, so I'm sure there's a lot of uh, deals being 
you know discussed uh coming to the startup yes it has been a quite a journey since last one month and i must congratulate that the five winners uh who will still have to go into the advanced conversation and uh, due diligence uh but the good thing is i'm quite impressed that uh, all the investors expressed interest in the innovation of these five innovators what was uh, obvious as i as an spectator i saw that uh the commercials probably needed to be more refined and that certainly calls for deep due diligence so what we will do as nutrify today is we'll we'll facilitate this conversation to closure so it's not that uh to the to the innovators don't be under impression that you have to keep following up with someone no it is nutrify today that will facilitate to conclusion whether it is yes or no it would be affirmative so stay relaxed and it will come to a final conclusion it certainly requires a little bit of more technical and uh, financial due diligence for sure and we mean to raise investments for you so this is not a glamour showcase that you see on tv and someone carries a check that doesn't get in cash this is something we mean to in cash it uh, so we will run that uh, through